Um, this session is all you need to all you need is to listen. So our first speaker um, is Robert Pekin. Um, the best part of organising this TEDx was Brisbane event was to meeting such amazing people, and Robert Pekin is one of those people. He's the founder of Food Connect, an ethical business that links farmers and consumers. Robert's backstory is as inspirational as his success. They say it's hard to keep a good, damn, a good man down. Robert Pekin is a good man doing great things. Please welcome to the stage, Robert Pekin. Thank you very much, and uh, it's a bit, uh, uh, bit unreal to be here after being a, a, a bit of a TED, uh, uh, whatever you call it, for quite a few years. Um, I've been a bit <coughs> aficionado. Mm, so, uh, um, uh, uh, and I've been pretty crook uh, the last couple of weeks, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into a bit of my story, and then I'll go into how it's... It's quite relevant um, everywhere in the world. But basically, um, I'm a fourth generation uh, farmer, third generation dairy farmer, and uh, uh, went back home after a short stint away um, when I ran away from uh, the Catholic priests because they, they were hunting me down. <laughs> I was the oldest son, and, um, and that was the thing to do. Uh, and uh, a wise uncle of mine took me, took me away to... Um, to have a bit of a chat about uh, me at the age of um, 15, 16, you know, going to go into the priesthood. And uh, he, uh, he convinced me, you know, one, on a two-hour trip up to Melbourne and a two-hour back from Melbourne to the farm, he convinced me that I should go and see the world. So the very next day I joined the Navy. <clears throat> and, uh, and the brothers and mum and everyone were pretty pissed off. So, um, but basically I, uh, I joined the Navy and, and eventually come back when... Dad rang me one day and he said, oh, my share farm has left. Uh, um, you know, there's an opportunity there to come home and, uh, and uh, run the farm and help run the farm. So, and, I, and I really was excited by that. So uh, I went down and I got stuck right into it. I, I started a dairy farm management course and, uh, and, and learned as much as I could. Because as a kid growing up on the farm, you see your dad do it, but you don't really understand what he's doing. You just, you just, you know, you just do everything. You milk the cows, you harvest the, the crops, you... Uh, you plant, you know, you do all of those things. You feed the calves, but, you, you, you know, in the context of the weather and all those sorts of things, you haven't fully grasped that stuff. So, so I got right into it and, uh, and joined every dairy farm, you know, field talk there was around. And uh, I wonder if I need to click this. Oh, there you go. So um, I... Uh, uh, and then about three years in, um, a lot of friction was de developing. Well, actually, six weeks in, a lot of friction was developing between myself and Dad. And uh, I was clearly seeing, uh, although, you know, I wanted to milk a lot of cows and, and you know, and, uh, and, and, and all that, I, I could clearly see there were some other things going wrong. And it happened one day I went to a dairy farm, man a dairy farm field day put on by my milk cooperative um, and Pivot Fertiliser and a whole bunch of other chemical companies. And uh, I'd just been reading a bit of stuff, and, you know, as you are when you're really keen to learn as much as you can. I read an article that basically said that uh, putting uh, urea, nitrogen, onto your soil uh, did freeze or, or had a freezing effect on the microorganisms in the soil. And uh, so this is back in the early 90s. And I went to this field day and, uh, and, and the pivot and everyone else was spruiking the usual mantra and, you know, up to a tonne of uh, superphosphate per acre and, you know, you'll be right. We'll still make a profit and blah, blah, blah. And uh, I asked this question. I said, uh, oh, I just read an article that said that, uh, you know, putting urea out freezes the microorganisms and, uh, you know, has other detrimental effects on the soil life. And, uh, the, the, and it was a very naive question and the criticism and the, the way I got answered, the way that question got treated, really uh, made me step back and I went, holy Jesus, you know, I wasn't asking that. Um, but that made me terribly suspicious. Um, and so, uh, so the journey then be began that if they're saying that to just a simple question, then obviously there's, there's more to be unfound here or unfold to unfold in front of me here. And gradually found a couple of other dairy farmers who were doing things biodynamically or organically or ecologically in the area, and we formed a little group and we had a dairy farm managers course. And 
And from then on, Dad and I started to see different ways. You know, he was into a lot of grain and uh, he was using pesticides and uh, all of those things that you do to make your farm not only um, look very productive, um, but also, um, you know, very monoculture. So uh, uh, two and a half years in, I decided the only way to solve this was to buy the farm off Dad, no matter what, and uh, he charged me a price way up there. And uh, I said, absolutely, whatever you name it, mate, I'm going, I'm taking it. And uh, so I did, bought it for a really high price. Uh, I bought, bought, you know, the cows that I hadn't, didn't own by then for a really high price and adjusted whatever I could and, and did all those things as, a, as an arrogant older son would, you know, when he's going to prove Dad wrong. And, uh, uh, and milk was uh, reasonably good. We were getting pretty good prices at that stage. Um, this is in April and uh, done all the budgeting and the planning around that. And, you know, the bank was, okay, yes, we'll, uh, we'll mortgage you to the hilt and uh, it'll all be fine, son. So two months later, the opening milk prices started for the next year, 30% lower than the previous year. Uh, and uh, I was in deep shit. Uh, I was milking 310 cows in a tenner-side um, double-up herringbone dairy, which means you spend you know, seven or eight hours a day in the dairy milking cows and I, I was budgeting on building a rotary so I could <clears throat> building a rotary so I could reduce that down to maybe you know, two or three hours a day or four hours a day maximum. Um, so there's a lot of plans and a lot of dreams and I renamed the farm after the uh, indigenous people or the indigenous I finally contacted the indigenous people and we changed it from my uncle named his part of the farm Fairview and dad named his part of the farm Hillview. Um, so I, so we, uh, with the indigenous people, named it Bambara uh, which means cone-shaped hill where eagles soar. Uh, and uh, I did all this stuff and loved the farm and planted lots of trees and, you know, went about this organic conversion. And it was, uh, you know, it was my dream. Uh, a lot of people come to the farm. It was inspirational. It was in dry land area, 23 inches of rainfall. Uh, loved my cows. I let them grow back their horns and let them have their tails and all of those things that... Uh, um, you know, a naive organic dairy farmer does. And, um, and I survived through the first year. We had a really wet winter, uh, which I uh, had some, um, some good plays. Anyway, at the end of uh, three years, uh, we went through two more droughts and, uh, and two more price drops. And, uh, the, uh, and, and I pretty much, I had no labour force left. I had about five people who worked with me on the farm and by, that, by the third year, I had no one left. Two of them stayed on voluntarily to help, but I was starting to go a little bit mad because I was so passionate about my dream and, uh, and I was so uh, proud I was going to prove Dad wrong and I was going to defy the banks. And, uh, and then February of uh, 1998, the banks said, uh, you know, you're out of there. So um, uh, I fought and fought. Six months later, um, a psychologist saw me and said, you're, you've gone stark raving mad. Uh, you need to, you need to just pull out, and uh, and and you know during that whole period of time, the whole suicide thing and everything happens, and, and I'll show you some stats in a minute. But uh, that luckily I didn't own a gun. My neighbours owned a gun, and I drove halfway down to get it, and then turned around because on the radio I just heard that a uh, not a mate of mine, but a, a bloke who I played footy against had just committed suicide. And uh, I thought, and uh, just all of that come home, I turned around, went back. I was still depressed, still mad, and uh, still angry, still frustrated. Um, all of those things that us Westerners get caught up in. And uh, I, um, I basically, and a couple of other things happened. Anyway, um, I ended up walking off the farm with a, with a huge debt and, uh, and nothing to my name apart from uh, a couple of things. But what, what, what I realised in that But um, so I'll just end my story there for a minute, Parker, for a minute, and say, put it in perspective with the with the Australian scene, but uh, also the the global scene. You can always just put the two together and they're the same. Just to sort of this is what pulled me out of it that this wasn't I wasn't an isolated case. So basically, um, the number of farms uh, in 1973. So when I was a 10 year old boy, 185,000, and last year. That's five per day. Five farmers leave land in Australia per day. Um, the gross value, this is the real kicker. So this is the total value of 
farm produce sold at their at their at their retail value is worth forty seven was worth forty seven point one five billion back in nineteen seventy three. Uh, any guesses to what it might be today? You'd have good guess. How much? Too many. Too many. Who would say it would be uh, double, triple, quadruple? Less than that? You're right. Less. This is an incredible figure. This is the one that really sucks. So this is what the farmers get. So back then, you know, about 43% of the, of the retail price. Now, it's actually really but worse in some, in some areas like the dairy industry. So, um, and then the other one is, uh, uh, which is really killing a lot of farmers and it's increasing, it's increasing at an increasing rate. Um, back then it was that, this, now it's that. And the other one which wasn't really measured, and it's very hard to measure, is the suicide rate back in 73 because they, well one thing they can't report them because there's a whole bunch of um, things that, uh, that the that the media can't talk about with suicides because of the replication factor. Well, I work in the opposite for me, so I don't know what that's about. But um, uh, um, but it's double the national rate for farmers, so it's twice. Um, and that, that doesn't include the the straight line, you know, the the car crashes straight into a tree, sole person in the car, no skid marks. They can't. They just go well, you know, who knows what it was. Um, but I tell you what, when I was thinking about it. It was, it, every time I drove down the road in one of those moods, it, it was like that's the easiest way out. As long as you, you, know, you get it right, um, it wouldn't be real good if you got it wrong. So, um, uh, so this is what's happened with the real farm costs. Almost doubled. Um, this is, I just thought, what's, what's it going to look like for 2010 for a lot of farmers? So this is a, a poll in the Farm Weekly, Australian poll. Um, so if you look at the bottom three, maybe break even and probably make a loss. It's over seventy percent. You know, you've got to ask why. Why do they still do it? What's going on? Sixty uh, percent of them all own all. Sixty percent of Australian farmers all earn off farm off farm income these days. Um, and so what's happened? You know, so if the farmers are losing, what's happening to you guys? So um, that's the uh, the increase in bread prices versus the increase in. Uh, well, the other one was this is the increase in barley versus. Uh, the increase in beer prices, 45% um, uh, faster growth um, for a piece of steak than the price of a cow, and uh, and this is the one for uh, for milk, which is what I was in. So this is where um, yeah, this is where I was when I went down. This is a little bit of a slide here, but I was down around the with Bonlac. I was with a different milk company. I was down uh, around 21 cents, 22 cents a litre. So, um, uh, so pretty tough. Um, and this is so. This is what I left the farm with. I'll dodge you. Um, loaded up with all my goodies. And uh, um, but another realization was because I, I left and disappeared to the Tasmanian wilderness for about six or seven months and just lived in the bush with a forty kilo backpack on my. I didn't take the dodge over with me. And I um, uh, uh, and. Um, Obviously, you know, all sorts of things happen to you out there and uh, thankfully I didn't have any money. I couldn't go to the pub and, and absolutely just get smashed. But um, I, uh, I realised a lot of things. And, you know, I had a lot of empathy for the Indigenous people, but when I suddenly sat with it and I thought, gee, I was only on the farm for, you know, um, 20, 30 years um, and, and I had a dream and I was passionate about it. I mean, these, these people had been here, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years. They'd been on this country. You know, they 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 belonged to this country more than I ever did, and I was I was a mess. And I thought, Jesus Christ, you know, what have we done to these people? Um, so there was a couple of really big realizations through going through that, and, I, and it's 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 really hard to hard to sort of describe. And, and in Tasmania, I met you know indigenous people over there. They were meant to be all gone. I was taught in school the black line had wiped them all out. Here they were, thriving, telling me stories, giving me messages on how to go into the bush and click, click rocks together to ask if you could go up that mountain or down this pathway or up that river. Um, so I had six months of brewing a beer down to here, pretty much wandering around, um, you know, with not many clothes on, 
most of the time reading a couple of books and really going completely, completely uh, primal and living out of the land and eating whatever I could out of living. I'd go back to the mainland. I was being chased. I should say I had a 90 grand debt. <laughs> I didn't mean to, didn't mean to leave that out. <laughs> Is that all I got left? Right, shit. Right. So, uh, yeah, Sander Finance, Commonwealth Bank, Telstra, they were chasing me. <clears throat> so I better move on because that's taken a bit of time. Um, okay, so, uh, so where am I going to go? So, but, but I really wanted to put a solution on the ground. I come through it. I'm, I went to a community shared agriculture farm. I could see city folk connecting with farmers. I could see, and that put the hairs on the back of my neck, I could see there was another way of doing food because that way sucked. The CEO, CEO of, of uh, Bottle Lake Milk Company, when I went out the door, was on $1.2 million. And every farmer was losing. And, and there's so many things that just suck that we can just give up on or we can take another, we can, we can challenge that. And uh, right now, in this, you know, the last two or three years, we're seeing the blessed unrest. We're seeing the status quo being challenged in phenomenal ways. And it's really sort of, it's, it's under the carpet, starting to come up now in bits and pieces and, and bites around the place. But we're really starting to see that us people can, um, can, can form a mutiny. We can take over the world. We can take over the way business is done. We can take, you know, every, every meal you have, um, uh, you're involved in the food system. And it's such a bad system the way it's done. Right around the world, it's really bad. And every, every meal you make has a, has, we were talking about it before, has such a ripple effect. You know, Graham Samuel, and he did this thing with Woolies and Coles last year. You know, you know the ACCC don't even have a definition of the word competition. Word competition means to strive to help everyone get better. That's what it means. And we saw it up there with that competition with the, the three guys from uh, I, I, whatever it was. Yeah, as soon as you put it out there, people share, they want to help everyone get better, and that's what we're seeing in the world of social business. So on the agricultural side of things, we've got some huge challenges. You know, we've got, uh, well, the Murray, uh, the Murray Darling is, is going pretty well at the moment. But, you know, in 10 or years' time, 10 years' time, it'll be back to the same thing again. Um, we've got huge erosion. It's still happening around the world. The degradation of our soils is huge. We've got uh, um, a lot of um, uh, oil, lots of things, resources are going to be running out. We have got a uh, huge population, and uh, we heard a bit about that before. It's probably not going to grow as fast as what people uh, say it is, and there's a whole bunch of things we can do um, to reduce the consumption of them. Uh, and, and we've got this still big businesses eating small businesses. And this is, a, this is a great example. Now, this is just the seed industry of the world. It's now owned primarily by chemical companies. Now, why would a chemical company want to own a seed company? Simple question. And, and why would they want to make a lot of money out of it? What's, what's the point? What is that all about? Um, and I can show you this for every industry. Food, hardware, everything. So how do we get to this? How do we get to this? Um, well, because I've got nine seconds left. If you go into a Coles or a Woolworth store, I mean, there's so many opportunities in there. You just go in there and you look on the shelves and pretty much everything there is crap. <laughs> if you go into... You go into, and I mean, most, you know, we're meant to be in the, in the world of, of goods and services. I tell you that 99% of the world is full of bads and vices. So that means that there is an incredible opportunity to reverse that around. You can go into a Coles Woolly Shore, see the baby food, and go, I can do better baby food locally using local farmers, paying them better, and, and being a hell of a lot more nutritious. Every single product. Every service you see that, that destroys the world, you can go out there and create another service, not a vice, and, and do something totally the opposite and turn it around. If you work for a corporate, take your severance pay, go and start a business. It's, I mean, I'm serious. It's the only way. We, we have got the power because the politicians aren't going to change. Sure, there's going to be some upswelling this year when... 
when uh, um, when the election's called. But we have got an, enor an enormous opportunity to actually spot those opportunities and go, beauty, Coles and Woolies own 80% of the market. That's a huge market share that we can now take back off them. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Thank you very much. I just, I just, um, we are on time constraints, but I just wanted to uh, get Robert to explain in, in three sentences uh, okay. what he's doing uh, around Food Connect, which is his idea worth spreading. Okay, so uh, Food Connect is basically a, um, an organisation that just brings farmers together and distributes straight into families, but now we're doing a lot of other things as well. Um, we're the first organisational company in Australia, a for-profit company that's put not-for-profit articles into that company so it can never be sold and no individual can make any money out of it. Uh, and now we're seeing lots of food businesses, little food businesses around Australia replicate that. Um, they're called social businesses or KICS, community interest companies, out of the UK model. Um, and uh, now we've set up a foundation and uh, the, the model's been autonomously replicated, called Food Connect in Adelaide, Sydney, Melbourne, just about to release. Um, we've got Hobart, ACT, um, just about everywhere. And it's a pay it forward replication system. So no one has to pay any money up front. It's all open source on this, on, you know, and we give them everything. We actually pay our Brisbane staff the wages to actually go and help all these other places set up. And then we think eventually, in three or four years' time, we'll, be, we'll actually have um, the resources to actually put that into all. You know, and it's not just the Food Connect model. It's any community food enterprise that you come up with a great idea to run uh, will somehow, you know, put you in touch with the right people or find some money or, or uh, stimulate you head down this direction and uh, create the necessary revolution. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Was that three seconds? <laughs>